Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Talk Data to Me, where we talk about all things data security. I'm your host today, Charity Speary. I'm on the cloud security product marketing team here at Lookout. And today we have Tim Lamaster, our VP of Global Systems Engineering, joining us. Tim, it's great to have you on the show. Hi, Charity. Good day, everybody. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. So today we are going to discuss five myths and misconceptions around the topic of zero trust. But before we dive in, uh, what exactly is zero trust? So uh, you may all have heard reference to the old principle, trust but verify. Well, that older way of thinking just does not hold up in the modern cybersecurity world. This is where we have severe trust issues and rightfully so. So when we're talking about zero trust, we're referencing an approach to cybersecurity where access to data, networks, and infrastructure is kept what is is kept to what is minimally required. And we need to continuously verify that access. So simply stated, it's an approach that trusts no one. And this strategy and approach is growing. In fact, 80% of IT and security professionals list zero trust as a priority, according to a recent Cloud Security Alliance survey. So let's talk about what zero trust is and isn't by starting with myth number one. If you manage your employees' endpoints, then those devices are secure. Tim, what's your take on this? Yeah, so that that's a good start. Uh, managing devices, in particular, um, you know, the employee devices or corporate-owned devices, is a good start. But it's it's just not enough. Ultimately, uh, data management tools and uh, you know manage devices uh, help your environment because you can push patches to them, you can update the operating system, the apps that are on those, um, and that's those are all good hygiene things that need to get done, but. You also need visibility to risk levels at the endpoint. Um, you really need a much broader perspective than just patching applications or patching devices. Um, zero trust works best when you have that continuous visibility uh, to the endpoint health. You understand uh, your environment so you can make automated decisions about access to corporate data, um, and, and remove devices that are not trustworthy, that sort of thing. You also have to consider things like uh, malware protection and, and uh, data leakage. Um, so managing the devices is important, but not enough in the end. Yeah, and, and you know, I think that just the sheer nature of applications within those devices these days and controlling mm -hmm. the access to those applications through authentication, while necessary is just not good enough. And so the data stored within those applications can, can be shared and that, that really needs to be a big consideration within a zero trust approach. So the access to those applications and the data stored within those apps, they can really increase the risk of potential data exfiltration. Exactly right. Yeah, so um, well, let's take a look at myth number two then. Uh, a device that has antivirus installed means it's free from threats. What do you think? Well, uh, so um, malware, typically antivirus, you know, solutions address malware on the device. And, and that is an important component of a zero trust model, but it's just one threat vector. Um, so there are lots of ways that um, data can be compromised or put at risk. Uh, it could be, that, you know, that the attacker is using uh, non, you know, non, you know, non malicious, non Non or fileless malware or something like that, and uh, other ways to compromise the environment. Things like uh, leveraging vulnerabilities in VPN servers, which is something we've seen a lot of in the last couple of years. Right, um, infrastructure devices have vulnerabilities also, and a lot of times attackers take advantage of that to uh, breach an environment. So that's another example where antivirus isn't enough. You, um, there are other ways that attackers can compromise the environment. Um, phishing attacks, one of the most common ways to uh, compromise an environment is via phishing. And um, that can be, you know, uh, a very significant uh, concern for most organizations, should be anyway, and uh, 
can lead to a breach of your uh, your cloud data, your infrastructure components, lots of different endpoints, you name it, right? Um, and then uh, simple things like credential compromise um, are other examples of threats in an environment that um, aren't addressed by uh, antivirus alone. Yeah, I mean, phishing is super prevalent these days. We, you know, I think I'm getting fished at least once a week, if not daily. So, uh, you know, I think that's really important that antivirus isn't always going to, uh, you know, protect us from that. So I think we can, you know, the takeaway is that it's clear that antivirus solutions alone just can't protect from today's more sophisticated threats, right? Right. Um, and, and, and phishing, you know, we often think of phishing, or at least a lot of people I speak with, think of phishing as an email threat, primarily an email threat. And there are so many other ways to get a, you know, a lure, a phishing lure in front of a, you know, an end user that it, it, it's much broader than just email as a threat vector. We have texting today. It's, it's, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Let's move on then to myth number three. Zero trust is just security basics. Is this true? It, it includes security basics, but it's much more than that, of course. Um, Zero trust really, as as you defined it at the top of the discussion, is is more of a, a, a mindset or a, a, a you know a culture change than it is a particular product or set of capabilities. Um, uh, in fact, uh, if you look at uh, NIST 800-207, which is their um, their uh, document publication describing zero trust, they describe it as a, a set of guiding principles. So it's a set of principles rather than a set of capabilities or something like that. Um, so much like digital transformation required a shift in how we think, zero trust is that same thing. It requires organizations to, to do a great deal of planning, um, to think about the environment that they have and what's most important for them, what they have to protect, um, because it's, it's much more than just basic information. Uh, for example, there was a time when we used to trust devices just because it had an internal IP address. If it was on the LAN and had an internal IP address, then it was we trusted it. And uh, or if it had a corporate certificate certificate installed, then we trusted it. And as you said at the in your description at the top, that model just no longer works. We now have to operate in this trust no one or TNO kind of environment. So uh, it is much more than just security basics. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's important to note it is kind of like an approach or a, a recommendation, right? At, at times, I know it can be overwhelming uh, for, for everyone out there listening when there are just so many vendors out there giving their own perspective on zero trust or touting a zero trust product. It, it really, you know, could be just a component of a, a bigger zero trust strategy. So, um, you know, have faith here that, that we here at Lookout are not leading you astray, but there are a really a lot of helpful and trusted third party resources out there. You mentioned NIST. Uh, there's also, you know, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. Um, they publish the Zero Trust Maturity Model and are always updating guidance. And the SANS Institute, I know, has some good publications, too. So as well as, you know, our, our, our friends, the, the analysts. So they, they, they can always guide you with questions um, as well. Yeah, and, and there are lots of models or, you know, guiding print publications to help organizations navigate zero trust. They're, they're different in terminology, typically, um, but generally follow the same concepts. Sometimes the terminology changes, but the concepts remain pretty consistent between them, I've found anyway. Right. Okay, let's uh, dive into our fourth myth then, that zero trust is all about identity. Um, so identity is an important factor in zero trust, and, it, and, and, and to a large degree, zero trust sort of uh, originated from the idea of managing identities. Uh, but it, it's it's really much more than just identity now. Uh, zero trust has to include your credentials, uh, your operations, the things that you're trying to do in the environment, um, the endpoints, as we talked about in one of the previous uh, talking points. And much more than that. So identity is a part of it, um, but you will also have to take into, th into consideration things like context, um, what time of day or what location is the uh, request or access coming from, 
uh, posture checks, health checks on the device. Is it risk free? Does it have patches? That sort of thing. Um, uh, uh, so uh, what they're trying to do, what action are they trying to download information or just view it? So there's a lot of context that needs to be considered as well. Um, so it, because zero trust is a very broad principle or set of concepts, it, what we have found is that it's, it's, uh, it's best to sort of focus on the data, focus on how do you protect the data rather than the specific terminology or the, um, the identity alone as, as a factor. Right. Yeah. I think this myth is definitely one that, that makes you think a bit more because of the association of zero trust and identity and access management. Um, but according to Forrester, 80% of attacks are from compromised credentials. So what that really tells me is that you can't always trust users, even when they are authenticated within right. your organization, um, which is why it's become so critical to monitor that user behavior and really try to establish a baseline in order to pinpoint, you know, is this risky user behavior? Is it, you know, what is this telling me? Is this a person who, who, who it should be, um, right. who, who they say they are, right? Right. And sometimes um, that, that isn't obvious um, except through, you know, automated systems, right? Um, so through leveraging automation and, 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 and policies um, can help you with that because it is hard to ascertain, uh, you know, by human. Exactly. Yeah. Different policies can help follow up actions. So, you know, you can alert an admin or simply ask them to reauthenticate. Um, I think in some extreme, you know, circumstances, just revoking their access until they, you know, contact IT, honestly, um, mm -hmm. is, is a way to make sure that your organization's safe. No, the point you made about, a, you know, making them, making them authenticate again is a great example. You know, if, if, you, you, I say you in this context, but I really mean if the system uh, detects something anomalous, you can force a second factor or third factor, a multi-factor authentication step again. Yeah. And that's a great point that you made there because that is a really good way to ensure someone is who they, uh, who are they, who they're claiming to be. Right. Um, which is important, you know, thinking about zero trust. So, yeah. um, that brings us to our fifth and final myth on zero trust, that employees can be trusted and are not a risk to an organization. Yeah, as much as we'd like to think that we can trust our employees, the reality is we can't, right? Um, and that's not only not always because, uh, you know, the individual uh, is intentionally doing something malicious or uh, risky. Uh, sometimes it's unintentional. Um, but the reality is that insider threat is a significant concern. And um, sometimes it's just simple things, you know, uh, unintentionally sending data to an email address that uh, is in your address book, what, but what and first and came up first, but wasn't the one you necessarily intended to send the data to. Um, uh, and, and today, the, the cloud interconnectivity is really amplified the impact of users or of errors rather. Um, so if a user does something that they shouldn't have or a, an admin configures something incorrectly, um, that can have a much bigger impact just because of uh, the accessibility and uh, how quickly things change these days. So this is why it's really important to leverage technologies and solutions like DLP, data loss prevention, and um, um, uh, behavior analytics, uh, sometimes you, you know, referred to as UEBA. Um, these solutions allow you to recognize or allow the automation uh, of uh, automating, recognizing threats or situations, anomalies, where someone's trying to access data at odd hours of the evening or they're downloading something uh, that they have never downloaded before or something they're not authorized to download, perhaps. Um, so that behavioral analysis gives you a lot more insight. Uh, and to, to be able to stop an, uh, the, a data leak or a compromise, uh, even when it wasn't intentional by an employee. 
Yeah, exactly. We kind of, you know, touched on that in the last one too. It's establishing that baseline of a user. And then, you know, when things are out of the norm, if they, if you continuously are seeing it, um, there should be some form of trigger and, and follow up. So um, that's a really a great technology to have and that to help enforce that uh, zero trust. And, um, you know, I think also what you mentioned is that obviously when we're talking about insider threats, it, it's not just, you know, a malicious employee. Um, maybe, you know, maybe have someone leaving the organization or whatnot, but it's mainly that threat of accidental accidental data leakage um, from copy and pasting and sending emails to the wrong people and all of that. So that really needs to be monitored. Exactly um, right. Yeah. All right. Well, um, anything else to add, Tim, before we close it out for today? No, I don't think so. I, I think we've touched on all of the, the key issues that that uh, come up in conversations with customers you know that uh, that i have and um i appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, talk with you about it yeah thanks so much for your time and thank you to the audience for for tuning in today we have a blog post uh linked in this post if you want to learn more about the ways to assess your zero trust security posture and we look forward to seeing you next time thanks so much thank you